This is Cable Beach, with stunning turquoise waters and 22 kilometres of pristine white sand. It's renowned as one of the most beautiful beaches in the world. It was named to commemorate the undersea telegraph cable that came ashore here in 1889, linking Australia to Java and the rest of the world. Many people are surprised to discover that Australia is home to the world's largest camel herd. There are about one million camels roaming wild in the outback. I'm on my way to the heart of Broome, often referred to as the Pearl of Northwest Australia. It's an exotic pearling town at the western gateway to the Kimberley region of Western Australia. It's got a history and culture as rich and vibrant as its landscape. Here, you can ride a camel along Cable Beach, shop for pearls in Chinatown, see dinosaur footprints, and bird watch in Roebuck Bay. For centuries, people of many nationalities have been lured here by the promise of finding their fortune. There's treasure to be found here in Broome. And so join me as we search for it, because finding this treasure could change your life forever. Broome is situated on the land of the Yaru people, who've inhabited this region for centuries. This country has an extraordinary history, and the Yaru people continue to protect it and ensure that the cultural stories and the well-being of the country and all the life it supports are well maintained. The Yaru people have always had a close connection to their land and the ocean which is expressed in their six season yearly cycle. This mosaic design tells the story of natural divisions of the year through flora and fauna typical to each season. Flowering, fruiting and bush tucker plants demonstrate the seasonal changes. The town's more recent history is a blend of colorful and often violent tales now mixed with a modern sophistication. Nowhere is this more exuberantly expressed than in Broome's old Chinatown. Once a bustling hub of pearl sheds, billiard saloons, entertainment houses and Chinese eateries, Chinatown is now home to some of the world's finest pearl showrooms, along with a variety of retail outlets. Sidework cafes and restaurants add a splash of colour to the pavements. One of Broome's fascinating attractions that has captured the attention and the imagination of pearl divers right through to modern tourists is the staircase to the moon. This natural phenomenon is created by the full moon rising over the exposed mud flats at Roebuck Bay at extremely low tide, creating the beautiful optical illusion of a staircase rising up to the moon. We're on our way out to an isolated rocky outcrop just off the shore where many people believe that the English buccaneer, William Dampier, was the first European to actually visit Broome shores and set foot here in 1688. As the story goes, he landed here at what is today called Buccaneer Rock in Roebuck Bay and buried a pirate treasure chest here just over 300 years ago. The locals say you can see his ghost here at night searching for his lost treasure with a lantern. Or maybe you won't, and for a number of good reasons, one of which is that Dampier never actually landed at Roebuck Bay at all. In fact, he never got to within 200 kilometres of the place. So we can forget about finding pirates' treasure here at Broome. 
Even though there is this granite monument built in the form of a sea chest with Dampier's name and coat of arms that perpetuates the myth. In the 1860s, the first settlers arrived and attempted to develop the area to farm sheep. But drought, dingoes, and sometimes hostile Aboriginal tribesmen doomed the venture and the idea was soon abandoned. Broome owes its beginning and continued existence to the giant silver-tipped pearl oyster, the Pinctada maxima. It's the largest pearl shell in the world and grows here in the waters of Roebuck Bay on which Broome is situated and along the shores of 80 Mile Beach. The size of the shell was huge in comparison to any other shell available and caused a sensation in European and American markets. The average size of the Pinctada Maxima shell was 10 to 20 centimetres across, and the nacre of the shell had a shimmering interior that also set it apart from the rest. At this time, many objects, but particularly buttons, were made from mother of pearl, and so it was considered a valuable commodity. Aborigines had been harvesting and trading these huge pearl shells for centuries. But in 1861, Europeans discovered the new species for the first time. This was the defining year in Broome's history. Workers from Japan, Malaysia, Singapore and Timor soon flooded into the area, lured here by the promise of finding their fortunes. Thanks to cheap labour, or in the early years, slave labour, the new pearling industry soon boomed. Within a few years, Broome was supplying 80% of the world's mother of pearl. And so Broome's history is inextricably linked to pearls and the associated pearling industry. This is the treasure that attracted people to Broome. And the way they reached this sea treasure was aboard these pearl boats called luggers. These working vessels were originally made of wood and were nine to 10 meters in length. They were built down south in Fremantle and were specifically designed for the pearling industry. Each was equipped with a manual air pump and five lengths of diver's air hose. They were the workhorses of the sea and were used to harvest mother of pearl in these waters for over 100 years. In the early 1900s, there were over 400 of these pearl luggers working the waters off Broome. In the early days of pearl diving, Aboriginal men and women were blackbirded, coerced into the industry. They were enslaved and forced aboard the pearl boats and made to dive naked with little or no equipment. Pregnant Indigenous girls were preferred as they were believed to have a superior lung capacity. They worked under atrocious conditions and many lost their lives. This bronze statue in Pioneer Park poignantly commemorates the indigenous female divers who, having become pregnant on the pearl luggers, were still forced to dive. It depicts a female diver gasping for air as she proffers up a pearl shell, a small belly protruding above the waves. It's a reminder of the contribution these women made to the pearling industry and also of the mistreatment and exploitation of the indigenous people. When the shallower waters around Broome had been emptied of pearl shells, it became necessary to move further out to deeper water. Now, the only way to reach the precious shells was to use diving suits and massive helmets. The new equipment and increased financial rewards attracted people from many countries to Broome. The Japanese divers were considered the best and were especially valued for their experience. They were specialist divers and soon became an indispensable part of the industry. However, harvesting the treasure from the pearl beds of the ocean did not come cheaply. 
It was extremely dangerous work. The hundreds of headstones in Broome's Japanese cemetery provide clear evidence of the risks that came with pearl diving. The bends, drowning, sharks and cyclones ended the dreams of many divers. Four devastating tropical cyclones hit the area between 1908 and 1935. Over 100 boats and 300 people were lost during that time. Another 145 deaths occurred due to the bends, when divers spent too long a depth and then ascended to the surface too quickly. This large stone obelisk honours the Japanese divers who lost their lives in the massive cyclones. In all, 919 Japanese pearl divers are buried in this cemetery, a testimony to the extreme dangers of their profession. World War II brought disaster to broom in the pearl industry. In fact, pearling virtually stopped. Japanese divers discreetly went home or were interned. And then Broome was attacked and bombed by Japanese aircraft, destroying many of the remaining pearl boats. After the war, the pearling industry recovered to some degree, but the heydays were certainly over. And then disaster struck again. In the 1950s, a crucial new invention hit the market. Yes, the plastic button. Pearl shell became worthless overnight. The plastic button sealed the fate of the mother of pearl industry, but not the fate of broom. The development of cultured pearls was perfected by the Japanese and the pearling industry was secured but this time by pearls themselves rather than the shells. Japanese experts were brought to Australia to try their skills on the giant Pintada Maxima. Broom pearls are some of the most beautiful and sought after pearls in the world. They mature in half the time of Japanese pearls and they're also twice the size. Within 20 years, the town was producing up to 70% of the world's large cultured pearls. Broome continues to be one of the world's major suppliers for quality pearls today. I'm on my way to Willie Creek Pearl Farm to find out more about cultured pearls. I want to find out how technicians seed a live oyster to produce a pearl. Willie Creek is situated about 40 kilometres north of Broome and Cable Beach on a beautiful and protected turquoise tidal estuary. So in the wild, uh, a pearl is formed when a small irritant makes its way into the oyster. Often we think of it as a grain of sand, but it could be a, a piece of algae or a pathogen or something like that. And uh, the oyster is going to secrete what we call nacre, which is a defense mechanism, and it's going to coat that irritant. So effectively nullify uh, any damage that that irritant might cause. And over time, that, that nacre will harden um, and more layers will be put on, and that's how a pearl will be formed in the wild. A cultured pearl, uh, it differs from a natural pearl, uh, obviously in the way that we are deliberately trying to form the pearl. It begins with the divers who are, who are gonna be doing what we call drift diving, and they'll be down in the habitat of these oysters, down about 20 metres below the surface, uh, and they're gonna be towed behind a boat and they're gonna be collecting wild shell. These healthy wild oysters are then brought back to the Willie Creek farm where they are then rested for four months to acclimatise to the new location prior to pearl seeding. The oysters are then relaxed and pegged open 
to allow a highly trained pill technician to perform the delicate seeding operation in a sterile room on board the vessel or at the pearl farm. Uh, a technician will plant a seed uh, into, the, into the oyster and he'll plant it in such a way that uh, hopefully that oyster won't reject the seed. Now with that seed, he's gonna plant a bit of mantle tissue, what we call nacre. And nacre is effectively um, liquid pearl. And hopefully that, that nacre is gonna form a pearl sac around the seed and over two years, it's gonna produce a, a cultured pearl. The shell is then safely housed within a pearl panel and placed on the ocean floor to undergo a complex turning process which encourages the development of a round pearl. Every oyster is pulled up and cleaned once a month using a high pressure cleaner and a knife to get all the barnacles and seaweed off that attaches to the shell so that the oyster can feed freely. They're also x-rayed to determine the size of the cultured pearl. They have a little seed that's planted in there and when they pass through the x-ray, they're looking for a little black dot that represents that seed. And that means they've accepted the seed and they're starting to produce a pearl. That'll happen 80, 80 to 90% of the time. They'll go through, they'll get a tick. So the ones that don't show up that little black dot, uh, you know, they're not gonna throw them overboard and say, thanks very much, we tried. Uh, they're still gonna head through uh, and they're gonna hopefully produce keshi pearls for us. So keshi pearls are the type of pearls that are produced when, uh, when it's rejected the seed, but it's retained a bit of the mantle tissue in there. So it's gonna produce a sort of unique, uh, a little bit gnarly sort of shaped pearl. Um, regardless, they all head out after their X-ray onto a, a long line, which will be their home for the next couple of years. The oysters are then transported to farm sites, which provide a pristine environment such as the waters off the coast north of Willie Creek. Oysters thrive in these nutrient-rich waters, filtering over 80 litres of water an hour, feeding on the microscopic plankton and other nutrients. Their native habitat is about 20 metres below the surface. Um, that's where the divers collect them from. Uh, but after they've gone through their X-ray and they end up on a, what we call a long line. Uh, so this will be out at, in, in the open water uh, they'll be hanging from buoys and they'll be about two to three metres below the, the surface of the water. With our big tides here around the Kimberley, uh, when that tide's coming in, it's going to have the panel up here spinning around. Tide goes out, vice versa. So it cuts out the need for a diver to go down and flip the panel uh, and the tides are doing the work for us to hopefully make a nice even coating around the, uh, around the pearl. The pearls are extracted from the oyster and replaced or reseeded with another nucleus about the same size of the pearl that was removed. If an 8mm pearl is removed, it's replaced with an 8mm nucleus that will hopefully become a 10mm pearl in two years' time. They can do this up to four times, so an oyster can produce four pearls in its lifetime. Um, the difference between a first seeded pearl and a fourth seeded pearl uh, is going to be the size because they're going to put in uh, the same seed as the pearl that they've just taken out of the oyster. You, you want a bigger pearl but your chances of getting a nice pearl come down uh, per seeding so by the time you're at a, a fourth seeded pearl you might have a you might be looking for a nice big one uh, but you're probably down around a five ten percent chance of getting a really nice pearl from fourth seeded whereas on a first seeded pearl you, you're probably up around 80 90 percent chance of getting a good pearl. The oysters are then returned to the sea where they are again suspended vertically about three metres below the surface and the monthly cleaning process continues for another two years. This completes the second seeding cycle. After a further two years, the oyster is again x-rayed and the whole process is repeated again. As oysters age, the rate of naked deposition declines, and so oysters are generally only seeded three times over a six-year period. 2% of all oysters are seeded four times over an eight-year period. So most large, lustrous Australian South Sea pearls will take three seedings and six years to develop. A pearl's value is determined by the five pearl virtues, size, shape, colour, surface and luster. The first thing we look at is, of course, the size. End of the day, bigger the better. Then the shape, then the colour, 
and the lucky last two being the lustre and then of course the complexion marks. Uh, the shape is all personal preference, but we do aim for that nice round pearl. It is very hard to find a round pearl nonetheless. Next thing being the colour. Of course, we want that nice moonlight white. We do also produce white and gold pearls here in Australia. Nice shiny lustre is something great to look for and minimal blemishes. End of the day, blemishes are kind of a good thing because it's like a stamp of authenticity from that oyster just to say that it is real. These Australian South Sea pearls are the most highly prized of all pearls and are regarded as the finest, largest, and most beautiful pearls in all the world. The appeal and attraction of these magnificent Australian South Sea pearls is nothing new. Pearls are the world's oldest gem. For thousands of years, pearls have been revered as one of the world's most beautiful and magical gems. With its warm inner glow and shimmering iridescence, pearls have been one of the most highly prized and sought after gems. And you can understand why when you look at this magnificent specimen. This is a priceless pearl. It's the world's largest fine quality pearl, the pride of Broome. It was grown at Signet Bay Pearl Farm not far from Broome in 2006. It measures 22.24 millimeter in diameter, 70 millimeter in circumference, and weighs 15.75 grams. Holding this precious and priceless pearl reminds me of a wonderful short story that Jesus told. It's found in Matthew chapter 13, verses 45 and 46. The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Here Jesus tells us about a pearl merchant who goes searching for fine pearls. He finds a very special one, a pearl of immense value. He's so taken by this pearl that he must have it and so sells everything he owns in order to buy it. This one pearl, this one thing, is worth everything. Nothing else compares, nothing else matters. He must have it. And so the pearl merchant sells everything he owns in order to get that one pearl. So what does this story, this parable mean? Well, a parable is an illustration a story designed to teach a lesson. A parable is an earthly story with a spiritual truth. So what truth is Jesus sharing with us through this parable? What does it mean? Well, the pearl represents Jesus. He's the pearl of great price. It's worth giving up everything in order to have Jesus. You and I are the pearl merchant we go searching for the pearl of great price, Jesus. When we find Him, it's worth giving up everything in order to have Jesus. But there's another way of looking at this parable. Instead of thinking of the pearl merchant as you, think of Him as God. So now the roles have been reversed. Instead of you being the pearl merchant, think of God going through the marketplace looking for the pearl of great price. Now the story is different. Now the pearl of great value is you. You are worth everything to God. God values you so much that He was willing to sell everything, give up everything in order to have you and to be with you. And what does God sell in order to make His purchase? Well, the better question is who? Who did God give in order to make His purchase? Jesus, Jesus, His only Son. It cost God everything to make you His. God sees you as the pearl of great value, worth even the life and suffering of Jesus, His own Son. In telling this beautiful story about the pearl of great value, Jesus wants you to know that there is nothing more precious to God than you. You are worth everything to God, 
to God, you are the one thing worth everything. You are the pearl of great value. Isn't it reassuring to know that we are of immense value to God, that we are worth everything to God? If you would like to know more about God's great love for you, then I'd like to recommend the free gift we have for all our incredible journey viewers today. It's the booklet, The Pearl of Great Price. This booklet will share with you the good news that to God, we are so valuable. This booklet is our gift to you and is absolutely free. I guarantee there is no cost or obligation whatsoever. So please take this wonderful opportunity to receive this gift we have for you today. Phone or text 0436 333 55 in Australia or 020 422 2042 in New Zealand or 770 800 0266 in the United States or visit our website tij.tv or simply scan the QR code on your screen and we'll send you today's free offer totally free of charge and with no obligation. You can also write to us at the addresses on your screen or email us at info at tij.tv. Don't delay. Call or text us now. If you have enjoyed our journey to Australia's pearling capital, Broome, and our reflections on how much God loves us and the value that God places on each one of us, then be sure to join us again next week when we will share another of life's journeys together. Until then, let's thank God for His great and unconditional love for us as we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, today we have considered the value of pearls, but more importantly, we have been reminded of Your great and unconditional love for us. May we always remember just how much You love us and that You accept us just as we are. And so, Lord, we come to you today to accept Jesus and your great love for us. Please guide us now as we follow in the footsteps of Jesus and prepare for his soon return. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> 